Good evening. Welcome to Liberty and Justice for All. You know, for seven years we've been on the air here and we've presented many guests from many different aspects of uh, the problems that America faces today. And in each case, somebody has been an expert on something and has presented a lot of information. And basically, uh, not to put anybody down, but they have said this is the way to go. And then the next person comes on uh, with something else, whether it be at taxes. One person says if we get rid of the income tax, it solves all the problems. The next person says if we get rid of the public lands issue, it solves all the problems. The next one, if we do the school issue, it solves all the problems, the health, and so on. And I've always said that there is no one single thing that's going to solve this this problem that has evolved in this country. And finally, along comes somebody, and I've known of this person's existence for quite a while, who has put it together so that you can understand the whole picture and do what's necessary for you. It's you that has to make the changes, not you making the changes for the country. If you change, the country will change. Everything will change. Johnny Liberty, we have here live in our studio today. Johnny, it's such a pleasure Thank to you have you Thank you very much, Dennis, for having me here today. Uh, and, and we got a chance to talk earlier, and it was great. And one of the things that came out was the patriot myths. Now, I've always said that there's been a lot of theory. And I don't like to deal in theory. I want to know what's going on. Now, how do we deal with the patriot myths? Because you get people out there that are so desperate to find a solution to their problem that they will almost buy into anything. Yeah, that's true. And so, what are some of the patriot myths and how do we get rid of them? Well, I would say the very first one is that there exists a silver bullet somewhere whereby my way or my solution or my idea or my court strategy is going to solve everybody's problems. And we have to stop thinking so unilaterally or one-dimensionally and start thinking beyond the box of our own particular viewpoint and perspective. Mm -hmm. Now I know that's a little bit tough because all of us come from some egoic experience of our life whereby we've come to certain conclusions about the way things are. And that's fine. It's just in this area, in the area of law or history or patriot myths as we might describe them, we have to start thinking in multiple viewpoints and in multiple strategies. And no one particular approach or one particular person has all the answers. Amen. I've never met one that has and I certainly don't either and I will never suggest to you that I do. But you are coming from an area that I've been trying to put out there that it, you have to know the whole picture. You cannot ignore this over here and think that this is going to change your life or the country or anything else. Well that's very true and when I started along this path of educating myself because I didn't start out as a teacher this wasn't a field that I went and went to college for to get a degree in I never intended to study law or money or economics or power or politics or sovereignty. But it turned out as a part of my own path of self-education, I had to touch into each one of those areas in my own exploration to my satisfaction, to the point where I recognized what the options were, what the choices are, and therefore I could make an informed choice. For you. For me, personally. Right. I didn't do this for anyone else, particularly in the beginning. It's turned out a lot of people have gained value from the research and education that I've done, which is great. But, but I did but, it. But I think the key, and, and the one that I would like for our viewers to, to know, is that they get this education for themselves. It's you educate you for you. And I've had people say, well, that's kind of selfish. What's selfish about it? Nothing's going to change. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Nothing more valuable <laughs> than a self-education. I mean, we've all had education from a multiple of sources, <laughs> going to school. We get it from our parents. <coughs> we get it from the churches and from business and different places. But really, who is ultimately responsible 
for your own education? Well, I am. Who is ultimately responsible for the situation that we're in here in America today? I am. Who is ultimately responsible for claiming your own personal sovereignty if that is a path you'd like to pursue? Well, I am. I have to find the way to that. And although I can take counsel, hopefully wise counsel from other people who have done things in the past, I have to ultimately make decisions for myself and I ultimately have to find out the truth for myself and then decide and pursue a course of action. And that's whether I'm going into a court situation, I have legal issues to deal with or economic issues or political issues or health issues, whatever it might be, we have to be responsible for ourselves and that's the starting point on the path to personal sovereignty or individual sovereignty is taking that responsibility and it begins with education. Now what I just got out of what you said is sovereignty is not something that the government lets you have. It's something you create for yourself. It's something that... you create and something you claim. It's a birthright. No matter what point of view you might have in terms of history and law and where we came from and whether we're American or not or black or white or male or female, in my view and my conclusion is that each one of us has a birthright of personal sovereignty. You were born with a mind, you were born with a body, you were born with a soul, a spirit, whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. You were born with the, the capacity to have freedom and to choose for yourself the kind of life and reality you want to create. Whether you are successful or not in life really is ultimately up to you. Well, it goes right me. back to all men are created equal, not all men are made equal by legislation. Exactly. All men and women are created equal in the opportunity to discover life as it is and to pursue happiness, to pursue property, to pursue whatever it is your goals are in right. life. That is a path to sovereignty. And good governments are instituted among men and women to preserve the rights and the property of the individual. Mm -hmm. Those are good governments. Those are also called republics, right. which is an old, kind of an old word that we often have referred to, such as in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you recall, and to the republic for which it stands. Nobody ever mentions the democracy in the Pledge of Allegiance. Right. So maybe there's a distinction between the republic and the democracy. Maybe there's more than meets the eye in terms of what and how we're speaking about some of these things. What would, what would you say? What, was, what does Johnny Liberty say about republic v. democracy? This is what I would describe it, and as I have for years. A republic is a form of government from the bottom up that arises from the sovereignty of the people, and it is from the local government, from the local government beginning with I, the mm -hmm. I that then assembles other people in townships, in courts, and states, and then the federal government. So a republic, a republican form of government is from the bottom up. And all of your rights, of course, come from God, come through the individual. And then the individual creates the institutions of governance in a republic. In a democracy, government and institutions are already there and they're telling you what your rights are and what they aren't. And so you're just the recipient of whatever the government says you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different form of government. So look at it this way, is that a republic is a form of government and a democracy is a form of government. And in America and in the United States of America, both the republic and the democracy were separate powers. So you had the democracy off there in the 63 square miles of Washington, D.C. in the District mm -hmm. of Columbia. That was one power. And that was separate from the power of all the states collectively as the republics, right. the state republics. And so you had this balancing of forms of government and powers. And that was the genius behind the original founder's intent for the creation of the United States of America. And so when in our minds we lose those distinctions, we lose something very, very important in the way that we're being governed today. If we annihilate the republic for the democracy, if we give all power to the federal, to the democracy, then we have annihilated the sovereignty of the people in the states. Mm -hmm. If we've given everything over to the sovereignty of the people and the states and have no confederation, no corporation like the United States for those common interests of the republic, then we have obliterated the democracy. Right. So here's where our thinking comes in and must change. And this is not just in regards to the republic and the democracy question, but in terms of all other questions. 
is that there's always two sides of the coin. There's always a republic and a democracy, but they're not opposites. They are complements. They're two sides of the coin. So let's stop thinking like partisanship. Let's stop thinking like the Republicans and the Democrats are opposed to each other because in truth they're not. They're simply were intended to be two we're sides a, of the same coin right. representing different points of view, but were a totality mm -hmm. and a whole in its conception. Mm -hmm. So that's where our minds have to begin to shift from this polarized thinking. And true sovereignty comes from embracing both sides of the coin and not obliterating them. But we have, we have come to a point with this crazy two-party system where people are actually saying we, we need to get Republicans in so that we have a Republican government, or we needed to get Democrats in so we have a democracy, which is totally bogus. It, it, I don't care who you have in, there is a governing body over the federal government, supposedly, or should be. And they, the government can only do what we've granted the, them the privilege of doing. But, so they don't really make any difference. Well, in many ways they don't. And for those who are naive to the way power works in the world today, the whole partisanship is, in my opinion, a ruse. <laughs> it is a method by which the people remain divided against the people. If you can divide the people amongst themselves, those who pull the strings of power can remain united in their power over you. Works like a dream. It has worked for a dream right. for millennia. It's the old divide and conquer strategy which power structures have always used. And people have defeated or been defeated because we have been pitted against each other, right. rich and poor, black and white, men and women, the, the list goes on and on, and ad nauseum, as I would say, mm -hmm. until you and I can raise ourselves up to the occasion of starting to see the commonalities between, just like I described, the republic and the democracy. Not the republic versus or against the democracy. It's the republic and the democracy is the United States of America. It's both together, just the way Democrats and Republicans actually are supposed to be representative of the totality of the country, the whole nation, right. not just one small set, or not just the corporations over here, or government interests over here, mm -hmm. or these special interests, or those special interests. So politics, in some ways, is simply the art of dividing people so that those who are in power can control everyone. Right. Well, I've heard it said many times that the Constitution created a republic with some democratic principles. And that's true. There's a lot of democratic principles in our Congress, mm -hmm. in our Senate, but it created a republic. It's a American states united is what a republican, a republic is, basically. So the trouble, part of the trouble we've gotten into in modern times is that we've obliterated these distinctions. We've lost the distinctions between the republic and the democracy. We've lost the distinction between federal power, federal laws, and state power, and state laws. All of these distinctions were put into place for a good reason by the founding fathers, and that was not to obliterate one interest for another as is often common in a democracy where 51% want to vote out the rights and the property of the other 49. Right. But to balance the powers between every individual and all of the interests within the whole nation so that power was divided between the federal and the state. Not that the people were divided, but that power and those who held power were divided so that nobody, no president, no, no congressman, no senator, no judge could get more power then was delegated to them by the constitutions which provided limited authority in all of the branches of government in all capacities whether it was you know, federal or state or a judge or a legislator or a president so that no branch could become too powerful and become a dictator over the others mm -hmm. and unfortunately in these times because we've obliterated so many of these distinctions 
the balances of powers have become very distorted. As we can see in the institutions of government that we presently are having and experiencing, where I don't hear anybody presently in government saying government should be small, <laughs> it should be limited, right. it should obey the Constitution, it should have a constitutional taxation system, mm -hmm. it should do things based on constitutional limitations of authority. No, I don't hear anybody in political office on either side of the spectrum ever even mentioning these things, perhaps a Ron Paul or two. But besides that, they're still desiring more power, unlimited power, no checks and balances, nobody to question them, right. and the people have become virtually irrelevant in the political process. And the people, many of them, are actually accepting that position. Which is strangely um, it's paradoxical, and it's a strange condition of our time, too, that we would accept such lowly conditions as to being governed by men and women who actually neither have the right to govern you in many capacities, but aren't doing a very good job at it. Mm -hmm. I would prefer my path, my chosen path, and that of personal sovereignty as best, to the best of my ability to govern myself in all capacities so that I can decide for myself through my own study and the course of law that I can study mm -hmm. myself to determine what the law obliges me to do or not do. Because every time I talk to anybody else, you can't find two attorneys to agree on what the law means. You can't find two IRS employees to interpret the statute the same way. You can't find two judges to argue the same way. So how are we the people supposed to know what is our obligation and what is our duty by law as an American if we don't study ourselves because nobody else seems to be able to agree about it? And so how can I take their opinion about it? I have to find out for myself. So we're clear right directly back to self. What I've been saying for seven years, it, everything goes back to self. Now, let me, let me throw a couple of things out that I've seen flying around and, and, and these are touted as silver or magic bullets. Redemption. What is that process and what does it work? Does it not work? What is it? It works sometimes. It works not other times. You have to define work. What does it mean work? What is success? What does that mean? Does it mean that you get a court case dismissed? Does it mean that, that the that's... judge goes, yay, hey, this is right. You guys are right. You know, a good argument. You know? <laughs> Or does it right. mean that, uh, what does it mean? You get a payment, you get a check in the mail. We have to look at a bigger picture of the judicial system before we can even answer that question because those who promote redemption, and I'm not against the redemption process, which is a commercial set of remedies under commercial mm -hmm. law, under the Uniform Commercial Code. Mm -hmm. But there are other remedies at law as well. And Mark Twain said it best when he said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, Every problem is going to be a nail. If the only tool you've got is redemption, then everything you see and everybody who comes to you is going to be a nail. Right. And you're going to want to apply that hammer to that nail. Now, it may not be appropriate in every situation to do that, and it may not be the most effective strategy legally to do so. So all I'm suggesting is this. I'm not here invalidating anybody's claim that they have a strategy or an approach. I'm saying make the toolbox larger. If you were going to build a house, you wouldn't just have a hammer, now would you? You'd have a hammer and a saw and a screwdriver and a wrench and a whole bunch of other things in there too. So I'm saying if you're entering in the field of law, for example, and you're looking for remedies, which is why there's so many experiments, I would say, in redemption, administrative process, judicial process, court cases, different things, because the court system isn't working all that well, and we're experimenting with ways to find remedy in a very corrupt situation. Right. And so people are going after redemption and straw man processes, but there are other tools in the toolkit such as administrative remedies and judicial remedies as well. Using the law of the land, constitutional laws, using what uniform commercial code and commercial remedies are, but also using administrative process in the Administrative Procedures Act and various things like that. Yeah. So there's many more tools in the toolkit. Let's learn about them all. Let's master them all and like a good builder, then when you design the house or the project or the court case, you're going to be able to build it more effectively, I believe, and probably have a better chance of success. When you have this to do, you take out the right tool. Take out the right tool. To if it. it's a nail, hey, hammer it. Hammer it, right. But if it's a piece of wood, saw <clears throat> it. 
Okay, you just mentioned something, uh, and I see this the, this poor guy or, or woman, whatever, goes into a courtroom waving the Constitution, saying, hey, look here, these are my rights. And they're basically laughed at. Now, how many constitutional courts do we have in this country? Well, that's a really good question, because you have to look at the whole line of authority that's required in order to pass a law. And this is, most attorneys don't even know how this works. But in our nation, or in our country, if you make the assumption, and I do, that the people are sovereign, and if there's anybody that wants to debate that, we can argue that, and you can say, well, it's a democracy, and the government is sovereign now, and you don't have any rights at all. But I'm going to base it on the assumption that the people are sovereign and always have been in this country ever since the Founding Fathers. The opportunity for personal sovereignty has been here since 1776, if you're willing to claim that sovereignty. And from that sovereignty of the people, the Republic was formed, the states were formed, or the colonies back then, and then, and only later after that, after the Revolutionary War, was the federal government created, after the fact. The Articles of Confederation and the United States Constitution came as a consequence of the Republican form of government organizing its federal state in the democracy. Right. So if you just take history back far enough, you can trace it back to the sovereignty being vested in the people. If you start, though, your history with the creation of the Constitution, for example, and then you take your public school education and interpret that, you're going to come to the conclusion that only the government is sovereign and you're just a pauper, a debtor, a taxpayer, sure. and a voter, basically, or a resident. Those are the kinds of terms that you get now. Nobody really refers to we the people as sovereign any longer, and not from a government point of view. But just for a moment, just bear with me and just assume that perhaps this line of reasoning is correct. If the people are sovereign, and all laws come from the sovereign. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was through the sovereignty of the people and the states that the federal government and all federal law was created in the first place, all statutes in fact, arose from some constitutional authority that was delegated to the federal government. All laws, all statutes, everything that Congress and the President and the federal system does originated from some constitutional authority. It has I, to I have. Wanna, I want to clarify one thing that many people don't seem to understand, and you said it. The uh, constitutional authority that was delegated to them, they have, do not have any power to do anything that the sovereign people don't have the power to do. In other words, we have delegated our right to do something to them to have them do it for us. And it's very specific in the Constitution what we wanted them to do. Correct. But we can't delegate, delegate any power that we don't have. And so they can't assume any power that we don't have. I'm, I just That's correct. That is if you're following the logic of constitutional authority, right. which is where does it come from? It comes from the people. Then the Constitution delegates that authority to government and to branches and agencies of government. And then those agencies of government have to have regulations to be able to implement the laws that Congress passes. So if you follow the line of reasoning, tracking from the point of authority, First, there must be constitutional authority for the branch of government to do an act, whatever it might be. Secondly, there must be a law that creates an obligation or a duty. So Congress can pass laws till they're blue in the face, but they can only pass certain laws with constitutional authority. Other laws don't have any constitutional authority and must not be confused with law. Then those laws that Congress pass have to be then converted into regulations which the agencies then can then delegate to their employees so they can implement them somewhere down the line, like an IRS employee or anybody else. Mm -hmm. So there's a chain of authority that must be unbroken from the very source of authority right down to the implementing regulation and the employee who's saying, you must do such and such a thing. Well, for me to have to do that such and such a thing, there must be an unbroken chain all the way back to the sovereign people, in essence. And if there is a broken chain, then you must question whether it is truly an obligation or duty, or whether it's just the political expedience of a political legislative body that wants you to believe that everything that Congress does is the law of the land. And I'll just read a little bit from the Citizen Rule Book. The general misconception 
is that any statute passed by legislatures bearing the appearance of law constitutes the law of the land. The U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and any statute to be valid must be in agreement. It is impossible for a law which violates the Constitution to be valid, simply said. And there are many references in Supreme Court decisions and precedent to validate that point of view. So a lot of the law that we have out there that's being implemented and executed are colors of laws, not laws with an unbroken chain of authority. So the poor guy that's in the, <clears throat> or in the courtroom believing that he has to do something, <clears throat> how does he research this, this chain back? It certainly isn't with a lawyer or an attorney. Because they don't even, they don't have any, they don't have a clue about anything you just said. And they've proven that over and over. So it's up to the person to educate himself, right? Correct. And do your own research. Any good law library, and on the internet now, there's just amazing resources. I mean, our mm -hmm. website, icresource.com, has a whole American law library on it of free resources that you can do research and find the regulations and find the laws and the Supreme Court decisions and all of these things. But let me take it even one step further back. If you're in a court situation, there's a lot of assumptions in a court situation that go unquestioned. Right. This is one of them, which is, is there authority? Is there authority? Is there authority for the prosecutor? Is there authority for the attorneys, for the judge, for the parties in interest, or not? And also, whether or not it's a legitimate court or not. Is it a real court, or is it just a legislative court or an administrative court or some extension of the legislature, which turns out to be the case in most situations. There are very few, if any, constitutional courts left in the United States of America. They were intended to be formed as an independent branch of government. Mm -hmm. But what I would say, much to your surprise, perhaps even in your shock, is that most of the things that are acting as courts today are not really an independent branch of government. They're not really a judicial branch. They're extensions of the legislature. They're political courts. They're legislative courts. They're tribunals. They're administrative tribunals. And in an administrative tribunal, based on the state and the federal constitutions, it only can have legislative authority. And if it doesn't have judicial power, that court, then it can make no determination as to what is a law or what is not or what is a duty or what is not a duty for you to perform. So there's a lot of politicking going on in the courts today and a lot of putting up the appearances that this is a judge and a court and a situation. Right. And I'm sure there's a few judges out there that might get angry at this suggestion that the judges themselves do not even have Article Three authority under the Constitution to judge and determine a law based on their own status and citizenship. Well, there's many judges don't even know what Article Three authority is. Many haven't read it, or they simply don't abide by it. The Constitution, right. if we were abiding by the Constitution, we would have far more limited government than we do today. Right. Obviously, government is growing at a cancerous rate, and nobody's discussing limited government anymore. They're talking about total government now. And so the Constitution, for all practical purposes, Yes, they laugh at you when you bring the Constitution in the court mm -hmm. because it has been so disregarded by our elected officials and our judges appointed or elected by presidents, by governors, by attorneys and attorney generals. It has been so disregarded as to be trashed into the trash heap. And until we restore some authority, some source of authority, we will not be a nation run by rule of law but instead a nation run, just like the old dictatorships, run by men who discern in the moment what the law is and they decide this is the law because it's expedient, right. not because I have any authority to do so, not because there's a law in the book, not because you have any duty and obligation, but because I say so. Right. That is, and let's call it what it is, that is tyranny, that is just a dictatorship, whether it's from the bench or from the president's office or the governor's office or whoever, and that is a sure symptom that things are amiss and that we've got off track and that the only way I know to get back on track again is by we the people waking up to the source again of authority, which is we, the people, are right. sovereign. You personally are sovereign, but you must claim it. You must extract yourself 
from all of the contracts and adhesions which have diminished your character and step into your full power as an individual and as an American citizen. Right. <laughs> that was Thank great. You. What I, this is exactly what I have been trying to tell people and many others, not just me, many others, and, but they get so hung up on one direction sometimes. So how do you put this all together for people? How, how can you get them to understand and draw the, all these things together? Most people are too lazy in the first place, but let's say we get those that are interested in it. Well, anybody, and myself included, we've all been ignorant at one point or another about something or other. And we've all had to learn sooner or later. But there's a difference between an ignorant person, a man, a woman, and a stupid man and a woman. And an ignorant person can be educated if they desire it. A stupid person doesn't choose to be educated, they choose to be stupid. They choose to not know that they can learn, that they have an option, or that they have a choice. So ignorance is not a fatality. Ignorance is an opportunity. And so I claim it for all the times and places that I've been ignorant in my life. And 12 years ago, I was ignorant. I didn't know anything about any of the things I'm speaking about right now. Not one thing. I had no interest in it until the point I got pushed far enough and hard enough up into a corner that said, you better wake up. Because if you don't wake up, you're going to end up where you're headed, which isn't in a very good place. So I decided to wake up, to learn for myself, and start studying and researching. And it became an exploration and discovery for me. And I made it fun, and I made it enjoyable. I didn't make it this, you know, me versus the government. And I didn't have to get into a confrontation. And I didn't have to go to war in order to discover myself, and the right. truth, and history, and law, and money, and power, and how all these things work. It became an exploration of discovery that was enjoyable. And that catapulted me into more and more fields and areas. And now I've come up with a very, very simple program. And it is a sovereignty program. But it's not some false theory of sovereignty. And it's not a silver bullet program. I'm not here touting any one particular approach here. Or that my way is the right way and yours is the wrong way. I'm saying that from my vantage point, if you are willing to wake up, if you are willing to educate yourself and claim your sovereignty, that's your starting point. Then we must step beyond any one particular approach, build a larger enough toolbox so we can practically function in today's world. Because with some of these things that are out there, you literally have to go live in a cave because you can't bank and you can't do business and you revoke your numbers right. and you're, you're just trapped and then you're in confrontation with the government everywhere you turn around and it's a headache and a nightmare and it's crazy. I don't advocate that. I think that's crazy. I think it's a great R&D if somebody wants to do it. If they want to experiment in that way with their life and bring us back the information so we can learn, that's great. But it's not a way to live. I would much rather learn what there is to learn and to develop my own strategy for liberation and freedom, which is what I've done for myself. Right. I've learned how to protect assets, how to structure my businesses, to do banking, to do travel, to do everything that you do right now, from getting a cell phone to the whole business without using my social security number for 12 years now, without having a state issued driver's license, with having all my papers right at a traffic stop, being able to do banking and business, being able to do absolutely anything and not compromise my sovereignty, not one iota in 12 years now. Right. And that is just one way, but it is at least a model. And the way I would suggested to you now is that sovereignty has seven aspects and you must master all seven aspects before you can be truly sovereign. Some of us only want to file legal paperwork and we figure it's done. Well, that's one aspect. Some of us just want to be political and sort of be an activist and vote for this guy or the other. That's political sovereignty, you know, call it what you will. Mm -hmm. But there's also economic sovereignty, which is a stumbling block for a lot of people. They don't have their economic house in order. They don't have any money, no income, no business, no way to function in the world of money, or right. whether it's gold or silver or money or whatever it whatever is. Whatever it is, sure. So economics is an aspect of sovereignty, and we have to master that. Those are the external ones. And a lot of the patriots have focused almost entirely 
on either economic, legal, or political sovereignty. Right. But there's four more aspects, and these are the foundational ones. And you could call these more spiritual in that they're internal. Where does it begin? Physical. Physical sovereignty, health and wellness. If you don't feel good in your body, it's pretty hard to go out there and take on the world, now is it? If you don't have emotional sovereignty and aren't willing to take responsibility for your emotions, your fears, your angers, and deal with that, grow through it all. Don't get stuck there. And quite frankly, that's where most people get stuck is in emotional sovereignty. They don't handle their fears. They get paralyzed. Right. They don't handle their anger. So they go into court and get angry. What does that accomplish? Nothing. Pisses the judge off. What good is that? Got to handle your emotional sovereignty and be responsible for it in a community of people. Then third, mental sovereignty. Take back your mind. Take it back from the media. Take it back from the schools that trained you, that taught you wrong about history and law and money and power and the democracy and all these other things. Take back your own mind. Think and reason for yourself. Make your own decisions. Mental sovereignty. Don't rely on experts or me or anybody else. Show it for yourself. And then finally, that last aspect, the spiritual sovereignty. Whatever your relationship with God or the Creator is, that's your responsibility to build and have that relationship. And that's your business, nobody else's. Right. So that's the seven aspects. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, internal, and the three external, economic, legal, and political. Which are, like you say, are the three that are concentrated on. Those are the ones and we focus a lot of effort on. But where do people get stuck? Where have I seen it? Every time for 12 years I've been teaching and training. They've got all the right ideas. They've got all the legal paperwork in place. they you know, they got the arguments on paper about a take on this or that. Mm -hmm. But fear stops them They're scared from to taking death. the first action right. that's going to be effective in their lives. So what good is the paper? No good at all to you. Paper is useless to you. Burn it up. Tear it up. Throw it away. Legal sovereignty is the last thing that I advocate implementing on your sovereignty process. Yeah. You master the other ones, then you can execute your legal paperwork and basically step out and say, I'm responsible for myself. I'm an independent and responsible entity. Okay, how do you get, in your teachings, how do you get to the person, and I see this all the time, and I know this is a result of the schools and the major networks and all this, you just said you have, you're telling people they have to think about what they're doing and how they're doing it and why. Many people out there do not know how to think. They do not, are not capable or have never been taught, I wouldn't say not capable, they have never been taught or witnessed reasoning and application. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like it. It's like a disconnect. You, the lights are on but nobody's home. It's is basically it. There's a it's you give them an instruction, you say something and it goes in and they acknowledge. And then nothing comes from it. It's like it they just don't get it. Now I can sit no I can't. If I were to sit and watch the news for a full hour, I g would get what they're trying to teach me. I don't have a, I don't call it television anymore, it's a teleprompter. Because it's feeding this disconnect in so many ways. How, when somebody, and there's people out there that are interested in, in what you're saying and what I'm saying, but they cannot comprehend it. How do we get in, how do we get past that? Well, I believe that everybody has the capacity, just like I believe that we were born with a birthright of sovereignty, which is a way of another way of describing a human being. We're all sovereign in a sense. We all have it. And yes, we may lose sight of that. We may lose track of that. Mm -hmm. We may accept conditioning from many, many sources along the way, which is where most people are stuck too. They've got other people's ideas in their head, other people's ideas of who they are, right? other people's ideas of what they should do when they grow up and get married and have a career and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. When you decide that either life is too miserable to go on this way and you want to make a change and sometimes life will give you those lessons maybe it's a critical illness maybe it's maybe it's an inspired teacher maybe it's an inspirational piece of media when was it that you were first inspired when was it that i was first inspired it was a teacher a man 
who inspired me when he started speaking about the nature of money and such. And I was so captivated by something. It was so foreign to me. But I was curious. It begins with curiosity. Curiosity like the child. You have to become like a little child and want to know and desire to know. And what we can do to help people is to inspire them mm -hmm. through creative, through media like this, through shows, entertaining, educational, informational media that isn't designed simply to mind control you or mess with your mind, but actually to elevate you into the capacity to reason. Why have we lost the capacity to think? Because for the most part, we're only taught one side of the coin in our education. We're only given one side of the story in our news media. We're told what to think, not how to think. And we've been so conditioned to that for so long that until such time as we either get balanced reporting where we're willing to see both sides of the story. Let's look at both sides. Let's look at the republic. Let's look at the democracy. Now you decide. Think about it. Think about the differences. It's a natural mental process once it gets stimulated and gets started. And it comes from presenting things in such a way where it's not one-dimensional, like we started out. So any one of us, if we're only coming from one viewpoint, we're just contributing to the indoctrination just on another level. So in some ways, let's be kinder to our audiences and to the students and the people that do have the desire and give them both sides of the story so that the gears of their own mind can start mm -hmm. to turn. You know, I can't turn the light on inside you. Only you can turn the light on inside of you. If you have the desire, even just a little tinkle of curiosity. Aren't you just a little bit curious? Just a tiny little bit is all it takes. And then it gets a little bigger and a little bit bigger. Follow your path. Follow your light. Follow whatever it is that you're curious about. And just like that little child, you'll, you'll go on a exploration and discovery and that's what life really is about for me and it as as for me and it should be for many people I think however I've come to the conclusion that for many it's not that they don't want to know that they have put in this this wall of denial and I've said so many times uh, guy works hard or, or girl all week long gets a paycheck and what they see is what's left over. They don't care about what's been taken. Now, I'm not going into taxes, but they're, they only, they're very happy with whatever is left over, regardless of what it is. They say, this is how much you get, okay, fine, that's it. They never question anything else. They've got enough sometimes for their food and their rent and their two and a half kids and that's that. Do you bother with them? I mean, what? Well, furthermore, I would say this, which is I'm much more focused on what I'm doing and my focus of my action, my field of action, where I can be effective mm -hmm. is where I put most of my attention. I don't concern myself so much with what other people are doing or not doing, for that matter. If you look throughout the course of history, history has been changed dramatically by individuals and small groups of individuals. It's never been changed by the masses ever, as far as I know. Right. So it's not required that we have a majority of people before we can turn the tide in this country back to the republic, back to sovereignty, back to accountability in government, back to a sound economic system, back to a sound taxation system, right. back to a sound and not corrupt justice system. We don't need a majority of people, but we do need well-placed leaders in positions of leverage and power to be able to influence other people, to be able to teach and instruct and inspire other people so that we can make the shift. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a majority, it takes the leadership. And I did as my last leadership training, the, the keynote that I did on the last leadership training was leadership of the future. The leadership of the future is a leadership of which exists out there, by the way. There are millions of people stepped into leadership right now in America, millions. There's not hundreds of millions, but there's millions. So my focus right now, and on the trainings and the success ed courses and the things that I'm offering, I want to reach the leaders. I want to educate and impact the leaders. I want to impact the people that are already doing the do, who right. are already taking the actions, who are already being effective, who already have at least half of the story, at least have a good deal of it, mm -hmm. and then just fill in the rest. Right. So that the inspired leaders can then 
draw the rest in. That's how we create the critical mass. It's not going to come from majority rule. It's not going to come on the voting box. It's not going to come from protesting out on the streets. It's going to come by the solitary action of single individuals collectively communicating and networking with each other into an effective strategy for social, political, economic, and legal transformation of the right. whole country and world, for that matter. But they'll also have the emotional and mental capacity to handle it. To Which tends to be the case. I mean, people who step into leadership, you got to handle things. You know, you got to right. handle things before you can step into leadership, and you have got to be somewhat healthy. <laughs> You've got to be emotionally healthy. All these mm -hmm. things. Otherwise, you just can't rise to the occasion. Yeah. So leaders have already got a head start in some way. They may not have the whole education like I would describe it here in terms of, you know, the economic scenarios and the republic and all these things. But they're very educatable if they desire it. Mm -hmm. And I find leaders to be far more open-minded. They want it. They do desire it. They do desire it. And anybody who's got half a mind open or half an eye open sees exactly what's going on today. And you can see it even through the lines of the media and even through the, the deception and the lies and the spin and everything else you're getting. If you're just even a fraction awake, you can see through it. And if you can just widen that a little bit and get some alternate news sources outside of the United mm -hmm. States, go read the foreign press, go read the alternative press, you can actually find out what's going on in world affairs today right. beyond the you know, 50, top 50 yeah. U.S. channels. But you know, uh, anybody that would question what you have just been saying with a, with a little bit of sense. Now that's one thing that's missing. There's, you need a little bit of common sense. But anybody with a little bit of common sense would see that every area you touched on, the mental sovereignty you talked about, there are influences out there to destroy that. Oh, there are. Big time. Big the time. emotional. This is a fear-based society. Everything is that comes through the teleprompter, everything that's in the newspapers is fear-based. They're trying to scare you. or cause make you react in some way that if you don't you have a problem health I mean this health situation in this country of treating these symptoms rather than the disease has grown into a national emergency as far as I'm concerned it's to you may be a pun it's sick what they do to people and what people allow because there are people walking around out there that are ill very ill from being treated for sickness and it's sad so when you say these are the things you have to correct in order to have sovereignty I say I'm proud to know you because you've nailed it that's what it is and they know what it is to keep you from being sovereign, whoever they are, the controllers, for, because that's the areas they attack, is the very ones that you say, this is what you have to do. Exactly. So this is really where internal authority is challenged by external authority. And you have to decide whether you're going to rely upon your internal authorities, what your common sense, what you know best, what you've learned, what your conscience says, what your ethics and your principles say, or are you going to just simply blindly obey external authority without question? I'm not saying go fight external authority or confront or go to war with them. I'm simply saying that at every question of authority, question it. Right. Make sure that if it is in fact a duty mm -hmm. for me as an American citizen, I am the first one to stand in line and I will abide by it. 100%. You show me a duty and obligation by law, going back to the Constitution all the way down that chain of command like I mentioned or that mm -hmm. chain of authority and I will stand in line with it but if that chain is broken or somebody has deceived me along the way or some official is kind of playing uh, taking liberties with the law right. and playing with it and uh, misinterpreting it or misapplying it in some way to me or it's not appropriate then I'm gonna question it and that's my duty my duty is to question authority when authority is outside the bounds. And I hate to bring a current event into this, but just like the, the army folks with the prisoner abuse in Iraq, it was the duty of those army people to not take a command that would violate a principle if that command was violating their conscience and a higher principle, just the same way if 
you know, you're the head of a government agency and you tell your employees to go out and fleece the public, it is the duty of those employees to go find out if it indeed is a duty or not right. to do so before they go out and fleece the public. Don't rely upon just the blind obedience to higher ups up there without them demonstrating their authority at law to be able to do that. Right. And then, of course, you can implement it. But to do that, you have to be a little bit knowledgeable. A little knowledgeable and a lot brave right. and courageous of heart because it takes what it takes of bravery to be able to step up and challenge authority even in a calm and you know, sensitive and gentle way. It takes courage to do that. We're conditioned so much into obedience mm -hmm. and to stand in line and just do what you're told without question and just give them your social security number at McDonald's because they request it. Right. I mean, you don't have to comply unless there's a duty and obligation, but it is your duty to yourself to question whenever you're being commanded to do something and a little doubt shows up that well, maybe, maybe they got it wrong. Maybe there really isn't a law compelling me to do that. Maybe they're just saying that and hoping I'll just go along with it because I always have and most people do and mm -hmm. you know, why question, you know, you can't fight City Hall, right? Blah, blah, blah. You know, that's conditioning and it's very dangerous. So we've got to pull ourselves up from our own bootstraps and step into maybe a way of being and a way of life that most people have only dreamed about. Or maybe they dreamt about it and they went back to sleep again. But I say that the hope and promise of America's future and your future. The hope and promise of the world's future as America is the world's only superpower. And if we're exporting tyranny all around the world now instead of freedom, then I say we are making a huge strategic mistake. Mm -hmm. And we owe it not only to the world, but we owe it to ourselves to be able to stand together and make a stand for our own personal sovereignty and doing what's right. And challenging Congress when it goes to war without a declaration of war and challenging the IRS when it cannot show the law or the authority or the duty to pay the income tax. To challenge the president when it acts under executive order, which it has no constitutional authority to do so. Right. To t challenge the judge on the bench that is making up law on the spot when, in fact, there is no law. And uh, you're in there and you're <laughs> you know, in, in their holodeck, so to speak. Well, you've given over your power to them. Many people have because they believe that whatever the judge says is law and they buy into that but one of the things that I, w I wanted to bring up and I see this because of my situation not personal well personally and with talking with a lot of people when you challenge authority and you just brought it out that it take it takes bravery and it really does the first few times but what I have seen and learned in many cases is when you do challenge the authority, you switch positions with that person as far as the fear. They actually do, in, in most cases, fear you because they know that you know something that they don't want you to know. Or, and so it gets easier after time. Have you found that in your situation? Well, I found you get practiced at it in some ways. And yes, they may very well because it's unexpected. They fear you because it's unexpected. They don't expect people to challenge authorities when it's your right to do so, by the way. It is duty. your right. It's your duty to do yeah. so. And, and if they can demonstrate their authority by all means, then you have it. Mm -hmm. But for anyone to feign authority and not to be able to prove it is, a, is usurpation of authority. And we can't can't tolerate that. Oh my goodness, what Americans have tolerated, what we've grown to tolerate in this country and put up with. I don't know if we just take too many drugs or pharmaceuticals or we watch too much TV or we're just entertaining ourselves to death or whatever it is, but we got to shut that down for a while and really take a deep reflection about where we're going here. Right. Because we have some still a chance for some course correction here. But uh, things aren't looking up, you know, since 9-1-1. We really haven't been going in the right direction. <laughs> you know, we've, we had the whole world there, you know, compassionately and mercifully, you know, with their hearts on their sleeves, you know, caring about us several years ago. And, and now the whole world's hating us for our foreign policy. So we ain't doing something right. And we've got to take a deep soul reflection of that and really look deeper well, I at think that. You'd, I think you've already answered that question of what we're not doing right. 
it's and I think you've answered one of the big questions that I has been asked to me thousands of times what can I do that's both a question and an excuse many people use that as an excuse that one person can't make a difference many people sincerely want to know what they can do and you just answered that question and that's exactly what you out there have to do you have to learn and do and there's teachers everywhere Johnny happens to be one that's just in my book were fantastic but there's teachers everywhere and so find out the whole picture and also I wanted to say one other thing and you said it at the beginning of the program uh, and uh, I believe your book one of your first books was reti was titled reclaiming your sovereignty your sovereign citizenship exactly yeah. and I agree with that and that's step one but also along with that is getting your sovereignty or reclaiming your sovereignty and then maintaining it because it's not as simple as, okay, I got it, it's mine to keep forever and ever. You have to constantly maintain it because it seems like there's always somebody out there to take it from you. Yeah, there's always new assaults on liberty right. everywhere. Liberty is simply being just the choice, the option to make choices relative to your own life. It's so and simple. It really isn't that complicated. It's not as complicated as we've made it to be it's much more simple than you realize. To reclaim your sovereignty and then to practically implement your asset protection plans or whatever else it takes, it's simpler to do that than to fight the system or to do all the other very complicated type of arrangements. Right. And I'll do everything in my power to support you through the website, www.icresource.com. You can always call on the 800 number, one 800 299-4497, get a free catalog, books, and things like that, and uh, that's where we begin. But they have to take the first step. They have to have the desire. If your desire isn't strong, we can't work with you. Right. We can only work with people who have desire, and if your desire is qualified and strong, we'll do everything in our power to support you, you can, on your path to sovereignty. You can only help those who will help themselves. Exactly. We're uh, running out of time, and I want to thank everybody for listening, and I especially want to thank you, Johnny. You're most welcome. Because please. this is very, very valuable information that we just don't get anywhere else. It's actually kept from us, and I'm proud to be part of presenting the true story. Well, thank you very much for inviting Thanks me today. For thank being. you so much. You bet. with Johnny Liberty and there's been several questions brought up that we want to we want to clarify and expand on a little bit one is this Iraq war what is going on here from what do you see what's happening here well I want to ask the question what are we doing there and by what authority are we there and did Congress through a war resolution or a declaration of war actually formally declare this war or did it just go to war uh, for expedience sake as it has done several times in the past and so that's the first question is by what authority are we there and secondly I'd just like to raise the 
the issue of the media and the way the war is being painted because anybody with halfway woke up or half a mind about them has got to know that there's some contrariness to the stories that were being told about what's really going on there. I mean, we know there's been about 800 so-called American casualties, but there's been also 10,000 Iraqi civilian casualties, which we don't talk about much. Right. And if we think that we can bomb that country into a democracy, I think we're sadly mistaken. And, and some of our conduct recently has not been very American, and it has not been very democratic, and it has not been very principled. I think we have to take a deep reflection and look at the other viewpoint there on the war, not just, well, why are we there from an authority standpoint, but are we there for oil? Are we there for gold? Are we there for, what are we there for? And is it actually furthering the cause of freedom or not? I would have to conclude that it's not furthering the cause of freedom. Secondly, it is not furthering the cause of security from terrorism, that in fact it is inflaming it. Right. And it is creating a hotbed of terrorist breeding ground in that area of the world, which is diminishing even our security concerns. So, you know, and who's fighting this war? Are they American soldiers? Are they foreign troops? Or are we fighting this war with private mercenaries who are being paid to kill over there? So there's a lot of unanswered questions, and I hope we would be able to, through our research of reading other media, go out and read BBC and go read mm -hmm. foreign newspapers and their accounts, because there's a balanced view there that you're not getting through the American press. Okay, and I totally agree with what you just said. However, you go out to the average person walking down the street and you ask them that question, what are we doing there? Well, the response you get is they were responsible for 911. They have weapons of mass destruction that they were going to toss on New York or LA or Which something. Which we both know. Both of those are not true and they've been admitted it's not they true. They admitted it's not true. So where, how come they still have that thing in their hand? Well, because headlines have a stronger impression than the back page of newspapers that correct the mistakes on the headline pages. <laughs> so many people are conditioned by the headlines. And if the headlines said there were weapons of mass destruction one day in Iraq, then that impression is left there. If it goes unquestioned, like so many things do go unquestioned, and then even later corrected, which it has been corrected and admittedly corrected later on, we still don't change our point of view, which is somewhat absurd in my opinion, but that's an uneducated view. Yeah. And it's also one whereby people are very impressionable. And the media knows that, and they use even falsities and deception and lies, and they promote those things because they leave lasting impressions on people, and it's hard to change an impression once you've got one. I, and, and it really is, unless it, you have you know a presence of mind to be able to you know reprogram. Yeah. And you go back to uh, what was that guy's name? That nasty one, Adolf Hitler. If you tell a lie thirteen times, it becomes the truth. The bigger the lie, the more people will believe it. Right. That was a quote from Adolf Hitler's book uh, Mein Kampf. Yeah. By the way, the Department of Homeland Security was a reference for Mein Kampf as well. It was pulled directly out of Adolf Hitler's Absolutely. book Homeland security right so there's another thing we have to question about where are we going here and what are they so what are they doing what homeland are they referring to and what security are they referring to I know I don't feel any more secure <laughs> since the Department of Homeland Security they created a huge new bureaucracy I know that and are spending billions of dollars on media advertising and promotional campaigns mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff but well they're showing up in places too in 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 individual people's lives. You walk into a bank, here's a little placard that says we must comply with the Patriot Act. What does that mean? Right. If I want to put my three dollars in the bank, what, comply with what? Right. It's, it's absurd and it's well, everywhere. Well clearly there's, there's an imposition here also of federal power over the states and the localities. Since 911, we have seen the largest expansion of federal police power in our history. In every agency, not just in you know, the Homeland Security agencies. Right. So if you look at that from a political perspective and a constitutional perspective, it is further not only eroding, but destroying the capacity to make a distinction between state power and federal power. 
which is a fundamental distinction of authority that we must retain if you intend on keeping a constitution whatsoever, a constitutional republic. So this usurpation of federal power, which 911 was a great excuse for, as there have been many other excuses in history also for doing so, Oklahoma City bombing, you know, the Civil War, I mean, we've always had events in history which have further centralized and expanded federal police power. Sometimes that power has rescinded a little bit back, but usually it's been more permanent. And that's the danger, is that the terrorist attacks of 9-1-1, the war in Iraq, the continued so-called war on terrorism <laughs> in Afghanistan, and 40 other countries in the world, and 162 countries of the world where we have military and FBI presence and CIA presence, we are going way beyond the bounds of just basically protecting our borders and entering into the domain of empire building, which right. is America the great power, for whom, though, is the question we have to ask, is that, if you recall the banner after 911, united we stand, no one ever asked the question, united we stand, for what? what? Right. Or for whom right. are we standing? So we have to ask a Dutch deeper question, which is, who really is the power structure? Who is holding the reins of power worldwide? Is this just another road on the world to world, world government? Is this just another piece in the puzzle mm -hmm. that further erodes America as a sovereign nation and further brings us into the hands of international communities and world government? And are we simply being fooled the whole way? Yeah. So let's take a second look. There's certainly a lot of evidence to the contrary that things are not as they appear to be. Right, and I mean, you go right to the actual source. In this case, uh, 911, the incident in the New York uh, Twin Towers. Question that. I mean, there's so many things about even that. At right, the first thing that started all this that are not being addressed by the public or anybody else. And the other thing that uh, I wanted to say is as a sovereign citizen, individual sovereign citizen, this bureaucracy cannot exist because you cannot control people who are sovereign. So if the people become sovereign within themselves and for themselves, this whole house of cards has to tumble. If you mind your business responsibly as a sovereign, which is that little footnote condition there upon the sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Obviously, just because people wear the band of sovereignty or I'm a sovereign, blah, blah, doesn't necessarily make them a principled person. You still have to be principled and still be responsible for yourself right. for those external authorities to be diminished, mm -hmm. if not eliminated, because they're obsolete. They're not needed. The external authorities are only needed to the point whereby you and I have abrogated our responsibility as citizens. And if you see the government getting larger and larger, it's a symptom that's how I see it. A symptom, a reflection, a mirror back to me and to my fellow citizens of areas of our lives that we're failing to step up to the plate and take responsibility for ourselves outside the voting booth and the tax paying booth and right. those particular things which they love us to pay taxes and vote and all that because it's another ruse, both of them, to keep the power structure in, in order, in place. Right. Let's go on to uh, something else and, and this comes from the same sources of Patriot myths. One, pa one person or group says, do this, and you protect your assets. This one says, do, don't do this, do that. And this says, the third thing, what about common law trust, pure trust, corporation souls, LLCs? There is no one size fits all, is no, there? No, there is not. So how do people know what to do? Well, again, education, particularly in structuring, or business structuring, legal entities, jurisdictions, it's very important to have either good counsel or to have good education. Again, many people are advocating just one type of structure or another and one mm -hmm. shoe fits all, which it doesn't, very obviously. And some distinctions are also missing that need to be there. And people do abuse these structures, as the IRS calls them abusive tax scams or schemes and many people do abuse them. If you're gonna use a trust structure, for example, then you have to have independence between the three aspects of the trust, between the trustees, the grantors, and the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. You must have independence of power and responsibility, just the way between the state and the federal you're supposed to have them. Right. But if people use these structures 
and they just play the alter ego game of still being a grantor and then they play and they control the trustee and then they're the beneficiary. People play all kinds of games about these things and it's much more effective and much more powerful to not play games with them but actually have independent third parties in mm -hmm. your trusts uh, so that one they're defensible because they will just collapse when they're challenged right. if you don't. And I've never advocated the abuse of any of these structures as I've never advocated evading any taxes that you're legally obligated to pay. If they can cool. show me a duty and an obligation to pay from this source income and this particular person mm -hmm. and they're not just making presumptions over me such as that I'm a US citizen or presumptions that I'm a resident or presumptions that all income and in every flesh and blood human being walking in the United States is subject to the income tax, right. which is not the case. Though the presumption still stands unless you rebut it, unless you challenge it. In the area of business structuring, you've got to know distinctions between jurisdictions, number one, which is a legal term. A jurisdiction is a, an area of authority. A court has jurisdiction over a certain area, but not other areas. A police officer, an officer of the court, they have certain authorities or jurisdictions in certain areas, but not over others. A municipal police officer can write you a citation in the municipality, but not outside the municipality. So right. jurisdiction, as it applies to business structuring, is that structures apply to various jurisdictions too. In the United States, effectively connected within the United States, statutory types of structures like corporations, CNS corporations, limited liability companies, limited partnerships, statutory trusts, living trusts, anything with a taxpayer ID number is a statutory creation. It's created by law, thus subject to law, by the mm -hmm. statutes right. under the democracy. And so if you're going to play in that domain, then you must be statutorily correct in that domain and obey the laws and the rules and the regulations and file the returns and do all you need to do. Right. Okay? There are other jurisdictions, and these are the things that, of course, the IRS doesn't want to hear this, that there are indeed other jurisdictions, such as there exists the Republic. Nobody wants to acknowledge that the Republic exists in America anymore today. And therefore, they don't want to acknowledge that there exists such a thing as a common law trust or a pure common law trust, which is not subject to the regulations and rules of the statutory trusts that have EIN numbers. Right. So if you just simply make the distinction between the jurisdictions and the authorities of those jurisdictions, you can see that there are entities here and entities here. Mm -hmm. And there may be a relationship between them, but they're distinct jurisdictions and distinct entities. So you can't just take one thing and say, okay, I'm going to be this. All of you people, hands off. Somebody has authority over that entity, whatever it is, somewhere. Somebody somewhere, and it may be the trustee that has authority mm -hmm. over the trust that you've set up under the common laws, which are not regulated and not taxed because they don't have tax fair ID numbers and they can't even get one if they wanted one because right. it's another jurisdiction. If I was a foreign company in another jurisdiction, I can't come here and pay taxes any more than I can go over to Japan and pay taxes. And what for? Why would I want to go to Japan exactly. and pay taxes? But they, it, but they can't say you're in Japan, you have to. Right, well there's assumptions there in establishing residence and establishing domicile yeah. and what citizenship you are and whether it's American or US citizenship, there are distinctions here that are muddied. And until they're straightened out and cleared out, most of the legal arguments that are out there and most of the government's arguments are nonsense right. because they assume certain things that are not true. They assume everyone's a resident. They yeah. assume everyone's a U.S. citizen. Right. They assume everybody's within their authority and they assume everybody they have authority over everybody too. Yeah. And if a government comes at you from that point of view, it's pretty hard to rebut that right. if they're not even willing to accept a distinction that was fundamental to the existence of their authority in the first place. And, and also, when I tell people ask me all the time, and when I respond with, I am not a U.S. citizen, they look at me like I'm some kind of a traitor. Like I'm, it's, it's just strange, the people's reactions, because they do not understand these jurisdictions. There are distinctions at law, distinctions between the citizenships of the state and citizenships of the federal, citizenships in the republic, citizenships in the democracy. So all of these things are parallel. And if you parallel these things all on a chart and make all of these distinctions and take your actions accordingly in each clear distinction, now you have freedom and now you have choice. As long as they're all muddied up in your mind, 
you're going to be hopscotching all over the place here and you're going to be abusing the type of structures you do and you might get in trouble for that. Again, it goes back to who am I? Always Learn goes back that. to that. Yeah, we've got a question from uh, the audience. Uh, I'm not actu actually from the audience, as you know. Well, but, you're uh, close enough. But I'm close enough. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about the sovereignty and we the people uh, thing and also the idea of uh, that if things are going to be changed, uh, they're not going to be changed from the top down. They're going to be changed from the bottom up. And uh, apropos of that, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, introduce this, um, uh, this particular subject, and perhaps Johnny uh, even knows about this, but there's a woman whose name is Catherine Austin Fitz. She was the former, uh, I'm sorry, she was the assistant secretary of HUD in the George Bush administration. She, um, she resigned in a, in, a, in a fit, no pun intended, uh, because she was uh, very uh, upset over the corruption, the loss of money uh, from the housing, uh, 59 billion from the housing, and she said another 3.3 trillion from the Defense Department. Anyway, over a period of uh, a, a year or so, she's developed uh, uh, some sort of a, um, uh, and I'm, I'm just learning this myself, so I'm not really explaining it too well, but there's something that happens locally that she's starting, which is kind of an investment thing where, where um, uh, uh, governments can be built up locally. I'm sure, do, do you know, have you heard about this, uh, John? Yes, do you I'm have familiar a, with it. You have a it's called the Solari Project. Yeah, the Solari uh, Project. And uh, basically what it is is uh, uh, forming local governments, and one of the, one of the chief features of it is, uh, is uh, immediately cutting off all funds from the federal government for, let's say, a, a community needs to build a road or a bridge or something, and the government comes in and says, uh, we'll give you half of the money, and then, but you've got to do this and this and so on. Uh, that's the first thing that has to go. It's, to me, it's an interesting and a very significant uh, 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 impulse, and it's one where uh, people could begin to experience on a practical level their we the people sovereignty. What do you think about that? Well, <laughs> let me, I can make a few clarifications first. Right. The, the Solari Project is, yes, it was founded by Catherine Austin Fitz, and she was, she was and is an investment banker. And basically, she had developed a software program that could track where all the money goes on every level, whether it's an agency level or in a local community. And so the Solari Project initially is not about forming a new local government. It's about informing local government as to where the money goes and flows and whether or not local investments and investment groups can be formed to better circulate capital within the local communities instead of having that money go off to Washington DC somewhere or to some big corporation mm -hmm. or Walmart or somebody like that. So through careful analysis, because most communities don't ever do this kind of analysis, they just kind of do what they're told to do. They accept federal money and federal grants on the condition that they do X, Y, and Z right. without ever analyzing that whether or not that tax money is actually beneficial to the community or whether it's detracting from actually the entrepreneurial activity of that community, which would be better served by organizing the local capital. Mm -hmm. So as they come to these conclusions, they can then determine whether or not they want to refuse federal monies or any kind of grant monies, become more sovereign as a local autonomous entity organize the capital within the community and reinvest in the community so they don't need federal money and they don't need tax money. So it's an alternative way of financing local areas and local development. That type of a community would flourish, I believe. Well, it did. It yeah. did for a very, very long time. hundred years in this country, actually. Until the Federal Reserve came along and started getting everybody thinking right. about that the source of money was the bank itself and the government was the great patriarch in the sky mm -hmm. that was suddenly giving us everything through taxes right. and benefits and all this garbage, which really, if you think about it, the federal government doesn't have any money, folks. <laughs> I mean, the only money and assets and property the government has is the assets, the taxes, and the money that it takes from the people that produce right. and give to the people that don't produce. Yeah. That is where the money comes from. So there isn't any great father unless you consider, you know, you know, Robin Hood a father where he goes out and steals from the rich and gives to the poor. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's the case, then, you know, you're 
argument holds water. Well, I've always said, and I've said it several times on this show, that because of what's going on and how everything structures, it would be beneficial for you and I to close our businesses and open a government. Set our own rules, just like they're doing. Here's our government. If you want to be part of it, uh, we'll call you this, and you just give us whatever we tell you and do whatever we say to do. And that's what they're doing. Well, in the beginning, of course, of the Republic, we did form all of the governments that existed. And all the forms of government we presently have have been co-opted through the monetary system, through the legal system, and through the federal system to be all part of one large governmental body, mm -hmm. federal and state, that has completely bypassed you and I, the sovereign people, and the sovereign states. Right. So for all practical purposes, we don't have any representative government anymore. The sovereign people have none. The American citizen has no government. We haven't had one for a long time. Right. So I'm only acting on that assumption now that I don't really have a government anyway, so I might as well govern myself as effectively as I possibly can until such time as we reform and rechange and restore those Republican forms of government again and make that distinction that's been lost right. between the Republic and the democracy, then we can truly elect our own bodies again. Yeah. So we've got to kind of trace our steps back a little bit and we're seeing signs of the failures of the democracy now. We're seeing the failures of large centralized governments. We're seeing the failures of socialized and communistic types of governments. We're seeing the failures of controlled and managed economies. We're seeing the failures of the Federal Reserve and other central banking systems that use debt-based systems. And we're seeing the failures of the internal revenue system collecting taxes and you know, imposing a tax upon people and on business too. Mm -hmm. And it's impoverishing everybody. Exactly. So we've got to, you know, change our direction. Otherwise, we're going to end up where we're. And at. unless we're sovereign within ourselves, if if we, then when when this falls, we won't be affected. Well, we but, won't be as affected. I think everybody will be well, affected by whatever goes on. But if we can create, and this is the challenge that I post to all the American patriots and lovers out there who love the country, love the Constitution that it's time to set aside all of those arguments that we have about this and that silver bullet, about every perfect strategy and my way is the right way or the highway, and start coming together and forming new institutions and new structures whereby we can restore those Republican institutions. Right. And I don't mean Republican like the Republican Party. No. I mean Republican institutions that vest sovereignty in the people and our capacity to self-organize like the Solari Project is a self-organizing project. Mm -hmm. Like so many projects, good, well-meaning, community-type political projects are self-organizing. Mm -hmm. We have to organize our own media, we have to organize our own capital, and we have to organize our own energy production systems. And if we can capitalize and organize those as independent companies and businesses and systems, then we can take back practically a new foundation for a new paradigm of sovereignty to emerge worldwide. Right. Absolutely. Uh, before we have to get out of here, I would like to have you give your assessment of land patents. How did we get to this situation of what I call what I call custodial title? In other words, you have a, a home and a piece of land, and you have no mortgage on it. People are saying that's mine. Well, it's not. The sheriff is your landlord because. If you don't pay the county taxes attached to it, they can still come and take it. How did we get to that? That's not how it was. It's not how it was, and it took a long time to get there. In the very beginning of the Republic, 40 acres and a mule, and the Treaty of Paris with Great Britain after the American Revolution bestowed those 40 acres and a mule to those who fought in the war and were able to then go out and homestead and those titles that were granted to them were granted in elodium. They were free and clear of taxation. Mm -hmm. They were free and clear of government liens, encumbrances, levies, rules, regulations, zoning, all the other stuff that we presently have today. Now, prior to 1913, all the private property in this country was held in elodium. Now, that was less than 100 years ago. Okay, right. so I know our memory is short, but if you just study history, you'll go back and find out that prior to 1913 in the Federal Reserve Bank, all property was held in a lodium that was owned. You would buy it with gold and silver, free and clear. There were no bank loans. 
There was no such thing as a mortgage prior to 1913. It didn't exist. You couldn't buy a car on time. You couldn't buy a tractor on time. Right. There were no banks that you that could lien or put a lien on property because they were held in a lodium. Right. And so the Federal Reserve Act was the pivotal act and the Income Tax Act that followed that began to remove those allodial titles from the property because as the bank controlled the money system and finally bankrupted the country for the first time in 1933, so it took mm -hmm. 20 years to bankrupt the country, take us off the gold standard right. so we didn't have the gold to buy the land anymore, force us into borrowing money from the bank whereby the banks made a condition of every bank loan or mortgage that the allodial title would revert back to the government. And thus, ever since you've been buying and selling real estate and having mortgages and bank loans, those allodial titles have been uh, abandoned. Right. They've just been abandoned. Just the way your rights to yourself and your title to yourself and your personal sovereignty have been abandoned. See, we abandoned ourselves. We abandoned our lands they didn't take and it, our properties. Right. They didn't take it from us. Well, you can say that now, but that's only because there's a fraud being implemented now because they're not telling us that they actually took it, you know, or that we abandoned it. Mm -hmm. There's not full disclosure there. So the way to get it back is by reclaiming it. Just the way we reclaim our title to self, we have to reclaim our title to land. Right. And that's where we get the original certified copies of the land patents, put an evidence package together. Now you have a superior title and a superior claim to that land than any mortgage bank loan, corporation, government body, any of these things. It's been determined, it's been res judicata, Supreme Court law for 100 years or more mm -hmm. that the land patent is superior title to land. So if you want to own your land, your property, and not just have a mortgage paid in full or not, then you have to update the land patent on that property and claim that title along with the equitable title which you purchase through the deed in the real estate. Now, there are many people that are doing this, I understand. People are doing it all over the country and have been for some time. Mm -hmm. It can be sometimes effective against a foreclosure or a lien or against a, um, a government uh, eminent domain, um, you know, wanting to take right. land for um, public whatever purposes they, whatever and such. They want. Because you have basically, if you've updated the patent, you have a superior title to that than any claim any corporate government can possibly make against that land. Now, true, we don't have a court system that has authority or capacity to defend that patent, but there's plenty of United States Supreme Court law that shows and demonstrates superior title and how that is achieved in land and in land patenting. Mm -hmm. So law, yes, you must have correct, but good strategy too. And the best strategy for updating land patents as is you have remote land where you don't have neighbors, rural areas, you're gonna have a better chance of doing what you want on that land than if you have a uh, you know, a skyscraper downtown Seattle that you want right. to patent the land on, you're going to get political resistance. Exactly. So you've got to be strategically wise and sound as well as legally correct and reclaim the title to land just the way you claim the title to self. Yeah. Anything else you need want to cover here before we... Well, I'll on? just, uh, just in summary, I'd just oh, like yeah, to... Yeah, that would be great. Just do a little quick summary here. Most people know me based on the sovereignty education, the books that have been published, the Sovereign Americans handbooks, the Sovereign Hawaiians handbooks, the Global Sovereigns handbooks, Elodial Titles and Land Patents books, and about eight other titles, plus a whole series of audio CDs now available on a number of topics, success education courses, leadership trainings, and the business services for setting up companies and structures and foundations and things like that. All of these are available at the ICR website www.icresource.com again www.icresource.com or through the 800 number 1-800-299-4497 and let me just recap with my vision which is that we the people will wake up reclaim titles to self and to property we will structure our companies, our businesses, our foundation, do our estate planning, set up our business structures in free enterprise worldwide, and present a new model to the world coming from America besides the tyranny that we're exporting now, that we could export freedom once again to the rest of the world. Free enterprise, sovereignty, freedom, renewable energy, and finally restore and build a global republic this time around, because it isn't gonna be just restoring America as a republic, We've got to step into the global realm 
and those of us who are sovereign in America are the only ones in the world who have the capacity to step into that and show the rest of the world how they also can be sovereign in their countries, in their nations, and personally as well. Right. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you.